Good morning. Hello, everybody. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I'm very excited. I'd like to thank the Vedici Group and Dr. Bodkier for allowing this presentation. And let me start by saying this is not a scientific presentation. So I think we can all agree that for all the excellent science we heard here before and we will hear soon, uh, we need more pieces of the puzzle. Science is the beginning, and my job is to bring those other pieces of the puzzle. I work for a company called Hadassit, which is the subsidiary of Hadassah Hospital, one of Israel's largest hospitals. And our role is to commercialize all of the IP, all of the innovation coming out of the hospital and make it into a business. So we look for the other pieces of the puzzle to build on top of the science. And we have a unique model which I would like to share with you today. So my lawyers tell me to put this up. So now, since we're a public company, I can say anything I want, and no one can, can sue me anymore. So that's always a good slide to begin with. I'd like to start with what it means an entrepreneurial environment. How do we take the science and create it into a business inside the setting of a hospital? I'm extremely happy the presentation is in a hospital today, so many of the people know exactly what I mean. How do you take this excellent science from the clinic and make it into industry? I'll then talk about Israeli biotech, which I think is a very interesting case in point. We'll talk about innovation, about the infrastructure, and about the investment. How do we finance this innovation? So you see the three I's. I will keep repeating the three I's. Innovation, infrastructure, and investment. Then I will shamelessly advertise my company, so if you need to call your broker today, please feel free. You'll know exactly what to say. And we leave some time for Q&A at the end. So what do we mean by an entrepreneurial environment? How do we help the doctors make their new ideas into new companies and hopefully into profits? First of all, everybody needs to understand this is a very risky business. And the statistics say that one of 10 will be extremely successful Three companies will maybe survive, you know, like a zombie, like the living dead, and the other six will go under. So uh, the financing people and the doctors and the regulators and the hospital, we all need to know that. We need to improvise because the map is very unclear, and we need to know this is a marathon run. This is not a sprint. It takes many, many years, and I'm sure you know that. People tend to focus on the IP and on the quality of innovation, but I want to focus on the people. And my experience shows that medium technology with excellent people is much better and much more powerful than excellent technology with medium people. Uh, we need to be very selective in the very early stages of development because once we start working on the science, there's very little we can do with the science. So if we need to pick our candidates, we need to be very, very strict and select the right criteria. Which companies will we invest in? And basically, the, the, the cliche says, if you build it, they will come. It's from a big Hollywood movie. But of course, the answer, the question should be, how do we build it and when will they come? And when I say when, I mean the investors. So some words about Israel. I don't work for the Israeli government. But I think it's a very interesting case in point. You have to remember 7 million people, but the largest number of scientists per capita in the world. Number one in medical device patents per capita, and number four in biopharma patents per capita. And patents, for me, is the measure of innovation. Companies are much bigger everywhere. Israel has very, very few big companies. Everybody can speak of Teva and maybe one or two more companies. <laughs> Most of the companies are very small, are very risky, but the innovation is there, and for me, as a technology development individual, this is very good news. If we look at all of the patents coming out in the Western world, the average tells us that maybe one in five patents is a life science patent. In Israel, it's almost double that. It's almost 30%, so one out of three patents goes to the life science, and that goes to academic excellence, but also to the entrepreneurial spirit. People are more willing to leave a nine-to-five job 
and take a risk and maybe another mortgage and borrow some money from their uncle and start a new company. So innovation, let's agree, is the beginning of the entrepreneurship process. What is the roadmap that the entrepreneur should think of? We're starting with pure research, which is fine. Science is very important, and it's good to go and travel and talk to your scientist friends in, in, in Prague or in San Francisco. But from the business perspective, we need to get to a product as soon as possible. And even that is not enough. We need to get to revenue as soon as possible. And how do we do that? The problem is there are many, many small companies in Israel. You can see that over the past 10 years, from 2000 to 2010, there are an additional 400 companies. So how can these 800 companies altogether survive and raise enough money? It's even more complicated because most of these companies have no revenue. All this revenue comes from one company, and we know that company. So all these other companies are in a very, very young and risky stage of their life. And any private investor would say, not now, too early, call me when you have clinical data. So how do we get these companies moving forward? We start with academic excellence, and we very quickly need to do technology transfer and pull the technology out of the university setting or the hospital setting and give it into industry. We then need to take R&D grants, and we must leverage government support. This is where government has to be very active because it is still too risky for the private sector. If we have enough infrastructure, we can get some companies into the IPO. IPO is initial public offering, and then we can sell stock to the public. But we must remember that the ultimate partner is the industry, is the big pharma. No small company can sell its drugs on its own. We all have to think of the Sanofis, of the Mercks, of the Lillies, of the Glaxos of the world, and we need to bring them into the picture as soon as possible. We need their input as soon as possible. If we look at the process of technology transfer, uh, it says here, this is one of the drivers of growth of the Israeli economy. It is very, very high-tech incentive. And I can recommend this book, which is called Startup Nation. It's by Dan Senior and Saul Singer, two uh, US-based journalists who have done a fabulous job of mapping out innovation in Israel on a very empirical basis, so it's a good read. There are about five technology companies in Israel, technology transfer companies, in the Hebrew University, in the Weizmann, Tel Aviv University, Ben Gurion. Most of these are universities. Hadassah as a hospital has the only technology transfer company in a hospital, and that is why we are so unique. It's a private hospital, so we can do things that the government-controlled hospitals cannot and will not be able to do. And these five companies generate about 20 million euros every, I mean, I'm sorry, the 20 million euros are invested into the scientific research coming out of the universities. We start up about 25 new companies every year. So in average, that's about five companies per university or per Hadassah. And the Hebrew University and the Weizmann Institute have two of the leading tech transfer companies in the world. And that's very easy to measure. You can see the royalties coming in from the technologies that you develop. If I was the dean of medicine here at the university, my mission would be pretty simple. I want to keep the university financial because the tuition I'm getting from my students is obviously not enough. I can do that in two ways. I can invest equity and buy a share of the company, or I can wait for a royalty stream. I can send my researchers out, and then hopefully something will hit the market, and I will wait for five or seven years, and one day we'll get some royalties. And this is working very well for Weizmann. Weizmann gets 7% on every Copaxone dollar sold by Teva. Teva sells about $1.4 billion of Copaxone, so you can see that Weizmann is very happy with this. In Hadassah, we went to the other way. We want to be more involved, so we set up the companies, we manage the companies, and we want to own an equity share in these companies. We have to understand that universities and the corporate world are completely different. These are two contrasting cultures. In the university, nobody talks about profit, everybody talks about basic research and the freedom of research, and the professor wants to do this and that and maybe 
a little bit of this and a little bit of that. They share the materials with other collaborating groups. It's very, very naive to think that we can transfer that into the corporate world. These guys are tough. These guys want to profit. They owe their responsibility to the shareholders and not to the trustees of the university. They are focused on one product or maybe two, and there has to be very tight ownership and secrecy. So if a researcher goes to a conference without filing IP before he talks about it, we can basically take his head off because that is a big no-no. You have to protect your IP before you talk about it. This is obvious, but I think it's worth mentioning. If we look at Hadassah, we can see that we are leveraging more assets of the hospital as we can. We can do clinical studies in the hospital. We have a state-of-the-art phase one clinical trial center run by one of the leading professors in Israel. We can give consulting to young companies. We do product licensing and research services. So Hadassah is not just setting up companies, it's also selling its assets to companies from the outside. If we have the innovation, this adds the second layer, which is the infrastructure. So this is I number two. If we take this even further and look at Jerusalem as a microcosmos of innovation, we can see the infrastructure on several aspects. We can see the human resource infrastructure. More than 30,000 people are in the biomedical arena in Jerusalem. Teva is there. Uh, some other very big companies are there. There are two big universities and some colleges, and this is one aspect. The other aspect is the R&D infrastructure, and this is Hadassah. We're now building a new tower here, and you're all invited. It's very, very impressive. And the third aspect is the industry. So by bringing the big partners who are ultimately our clients, we can get their input, we can get spin-offs, we can get some IP, we can get managers who want to leave Teva and start a startup company in the university. So this is the third aspect. If we are trying to sell this to an investor, we need to show the potential upside. And this is a very important slide because it shows how the trade-off happens. The further we can push our company on the line of development from preclinical all the way to phase three, you can see the terms of the deals getting much, much more powerful. You can see that a company with a phase one drug can expect about $10 million on the day it licenses its drug to industry. You can then, you can then see a stream of milestone-based payments on phase two and phase three, but obviously down here is what we are all interested in. So if you have enough oxygen in your lungs and you can get all the way to royalties, this is where the big money is for the startups. And to me, this is encouraging because we can see, and this is an independent study, that our clients are paying much more now than they used to pay five years ago. So that's good news. The main reason for our industry to continue and thrive is this slide. This looks at the 10 leading pharma companies going forward for four years. And you can see that these guys, some of them are about to lose about 40% or 50% of their income because of IP expiration. If we think about it, we remember this industry is about 20 years old. Amgen, Biogen, Genentech all started in the early 80s. So their basic patents are now going kaput. And the generic companies like Teva are going to have a big field day. They're going to be very happy as these guys lose the protection over their ethical drugs. So these guys have to improvise. They can set up a very expensive in-house center or they can send some business development people to Tel Aviv or Bangalore or Singapore and buy these companies very, very cheap. And I'm happy to say that one of our companies has a big deal with Sanofi uh, from April this year. And this is the first investment Sanofi Aventis has done in Israel over the past 10 years. So that's very, very exciting for us, and it's obviously a fantastic partner. So the market demand obviously exists. They want to see more products. And not only do they want to see them, the Wall Street Journal tells us that the big pharma is now licensing products in preclinical stages, in phase one and phase two, more than ever before. This is a big shift. 
these guys were not willing to move before phase two or phase three, and now they're looking at much, much earlier projects, and they're paying more for these projects. So again, this is good news for us. Where does Hadassit come in? Where do we try to fill a, a gap? If you're a doctor here in the hospital and you have a great idea for an antibody to treat uh, 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 Alzheimer's or cancer, you will probably be able to raise a small amount of money. You can talk to the grant officer here at the hospital, angels, and you know the three Fs, friends, family, fools. These guys can give you this amount of money. On the other hand, when you have your clinical data, you can talk to the VCs and the corporates and, and maybe Sanofi and, and the big guys. But how do you get from here to here? How do you generate enough interest to bring in your partners? We need to build a bridge over this valley of death, we like to call it. And this is what we're trying to do in Hadassid Bio Holdings. And this does not mean only money. This needs management help, and this needs infrastructure and clinical preparation, working with the regulator. This is a lot of work, and not always do the doctors know exactly how to do this. So how do we do it at Adasig Bio Holdings? We were set up in 2006, and the first thing we did was take the company public. The hospital could not fund us enough, so we sold shares on the Tel Aviv Exchange. This was the second company in the biotech space on the Tel Aviv Exchange. And people in Israel realized that Hadassah is a fantastic hospital with amazing science, so they bought the stock. And over the past four years, we raised over 30 million U.S. Uh, uh, from the public markets, and the public now owns more than half of the company, which is fine. Hadassah is very happy. Hadassah supplies the IP, Hadassah supplies the infrastructure, and the public supplies the financing. So everybody puts something else into this equation. We now have seven companies on board. All of the IP was developed in the hospital, and half of our portfolio is already in clinical trials. And this, again, is a big achievement because a clinical trial is really what separates the boys from the men in, in this field. Another difficult issue is what to focus on. It's very easy to lose focus in a big hospital because there are endless amounts of deal flow and, and, and very bright professors and, and physicians. You have to focus on the fields in which you had the most value. And for us, that's oncology, autoimmune disease, and stem cells tissue engineering and cell therapy. This is where Hadassah is a world leader, and this is where we want to leverage that knowledge and the infrastructure. So the strategy, as we like to call it, is I to the third. We get the innovation from the hospital and from the doctors. We sit inside the hospital in-house so we can leverage all of the infrastructure. We have a GMP facility, we have an animal house, we have a clinical trial facility, and all our companies have access to this at a very low cost. If we can add fuel from the public market and use that money to leverage these two elements, we think this is a very effective tool in bringing down the risk. And let's, let's, let's assume the scientific risk is given. It's a constant. But if we bring down the financial risk and the operational risk, the investors should be happy. Where do we come into the game? You can see that academia deals with seed companies, and they basically offer limited financial support. Then comes the government and the incubators. Then come the bigger incubators, like uh, 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 some of the incubators we have in Israel, and some specializing VC funds, like Sofinova here, for example. And then as we move on, we get to bigger partners, and the pharmaceutical companies are here at the end. Our job is here. We pick up the companies at a preclinical stage, we give them a lot of support, and we prepare them for the pharma company. And I'm happy to say that the pharma is now moving towards earlier stages, and we just talked about the reason for that. Just a few slides of science from our portfolio. We have seven companies. As I said, four of them are in the clinic, and the other three will enter within a year from today. One of the companies, by the name of Enlivex, has a very unique method for cell therapy for a deadly disease called GVHD, graft versus host disease, which attacks about 30% of the people going bone marrow transplantation. They can deal with the cells from the donor and the recipient, make them live in peace with each other, and then reinfuse them into the recipient. 
They're in a phase one, two trial now with results from 11 patients already in Hadassah. Very, very promising results. They're now seeking a partner for the next phase, and they're talking to two pharma companies from Europe and the United States. Another company is CAR, which I'm extremely proud of here in France. As I said, their partner is Sanofi. Uh, they closed a $3 million investment in April this year, and they're now raising more money. They're looking for financial investors who will build on the expertise of the company and of Sanofi, and they will enter in the same exact financial terms. So this is still an open deal, and we're working very hard on that. These are our partners so far. These companies are all large companies with very deep pockets, obviously deeper than Hadassah's. But this is not only about the money. These guys can also bring strategic contacts and ad additional capabilities. They do the due diligence. They tell me that the science is really good. It's not, it's not hard for me to appreciate the science coming out of my institution. I need external validation all the time. And if I focus on the right stage, I think I can do return on investment. This is a very important slide. It covers data from 1985, from proof of concept, all the way to approval of a new drug. And you can see that in phase one, the statistical probability of success of the clinical trial is not bad, is 70%, while the percentage of the total investment is not very high. They say it's 2% and about $8 million. But if we go to the next phase, it becomes much more risky and much, much more expensive. So for a small company with a limited budget, this is our sweet spot. And this is where we want to be. The success to investment ratio is working in our favor. This is where we add value. In Jerusalem, they have managed to combine all the elements we've talked about so far. They increase awareness and visibility. They attract the companies and the money into Jerusalem. They base that on the R&D. They create new companies at Hadassah and at Hebrew University. And we work with unmet industry needs by bringing in the pharma partners very early. So I'd like to summarize so that we have enough time for Q&A. As I said before, world-class science is a start. It's essential, and it's the basis of creation for new companies, but it is definitely not sufficient. The research should be directed at niche markets. I don't think it's wise to compete with the giants where they feel the most comfortable. I think we should go for smaller markets, for rare diseases, for diseases that have a drug which is toxic and needs to be detoxified, or which is expensive and needs to be made cheaper. I always bring Protalix, which is an Israeli company I used to work for as an example. They have a drug for Gaucher disease, which has maybe 7,000 patients worldwide. But the drug is so expensive today as it's sold by Genentech, I'm sorry, by Genzyme, that the FDA gave them a super fast track regulation. They're on the verge of approving the market, and, and the company is traded at 650 million US for a tiny, tiny disease. So the market size is not always the most important thing. Bring in, and I said this before, bring in the industry partners as early as possible because they are your clients. They will sell it to the patients. Don't think about the patients. Think about the partners. And the financial terms are secondary. And this I can say with some scars on my back, as they say. I have had many fights with many bright scientists over valuations and over terms but that's secondary. If you get the money into your company, the valuation is, it's a romantic, old-fashioned term. The main thing is to get the money in. And it's better to own 10% of a big company than 95% of something that has no value and is closed and has no more activity. The government and the regulators need to know this, and they need to cover these early stages because these are very risky stages. At least in Israel, I can say that the government is providing nice amounts of money. It's never enough, and I can't say a good word about the government, but it's not bad. I also know that the public markets have changed considerably, and the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange has changed its regulations and its entry level so that young companies can move in and sell their stock to the public at a much earlier stage. Having said all that, 
This is still a very risky game. It's a high reward game, but it's a marathon run. This is another American movie. It's not show me the money here. It's show me the data. And the companies who will show the data that is powerful enough will get the right partners. And with the right partners, they can enter the markets. Thank you very much.